What if the breeze theory that everyone has been speculating is not going to play out the way you think it will? Is it possible that Ronnie is not actually Breeze, but the person that is has already been revealed on the show, and I think that person just might be. What's going on everyone, Just Be here, and I'm breaking down the latest episode of Power Book 3, Raising Canaan, Season 3, Episode 4, titled In Sheep's Clothing. We're diving into the biggest parts of this episode right now. Let's go. So this is a very big Ronnie centric, Ronnie heavy episode. And in the last episode, one of the final shots that we saw was Ronnie spying on Kanan and Famous's operation. And he didn't really say anything. He was just kind of standing there across the street and Famous let him know that, you know, hey, looks like we have a visitor. So we can safely assume that Ronnie has been keeping an eye on Kanan for a couple of days just because in the last episode, he also was spying on Unique. So this is apparently his thing. He spies. So we see him now in this particular episode. He makes a stop to Snaps and Pop Henry, who are a retired couple from the game. And this is our first appearance of them in the series and he used to encounter them back in the day before he got wrapped up and sent to prison he comes to them looking for them to invest in his new operation and he explains to them that he's kind of on the outs right now with unique unique wants to just kind of lay low and do his thing but really and truly unique just doesn't want ronnie wrapped up in his part of what he's got going on and they are both at this stage lying to each other about what the other's got going on and so who knows how that's going to play out he uses the henry's as investors so that he can be able to now buy product from a new supplier who we then find out later he approaches dean from seasons one and two uh the bingo guy is how a lot of the fans refer to him as and dean turns him down because he also himself is retired from the game and now we get this recurring theme within not just this season but it's in the, at this episode right we see a number of people who are quote-unquote retired from the game remember in my previous breakdowns where i also mentioned the fact that rock saying that she wants to quote-unquote retire from the game is a whole ghost fallacy because the reality is that there's only one way out but now we see all these other people who have retired. And even in this episode, we see later on that Ronnie takes out Dean. And so that just goes back to support what I'm saying here. And what we all know as fans is just that there's only one way out of this thing. You don't just retire and have a nice life and uh, uh, sit on the porch and drink in lemonade and iced tea for the rest of your days. And I think that's something that the writers were trying to just subtly put inside there so we can kind of catch on to with having all these retired players. So Ronnie takes out Dean after Dean snitches to Unique and tells Unique that, listen, your brother came to me and he was looking for me to be able to supply him and I turned him down. And that causes Dean later on in the episode, right? So the next potential supplier Ronnie approaches is Joaquin and Juliana. And remember, they are the Colombians who where Juliana used to own the convenience store where Rock used to house all of her cash within the first two seasons. Juliana is now on the outs with Rock after Rock told them earlier in this season that she's out of the game. But for some reason, Juliana really wants to stick it to Rock for some reason. So you see her even after Joaquin turns Ronnie down saying, we can't supply you. Juliana still turns back and just gives him a look as he's kind of walking off. And that leads us to believe here that mm, it's very quite possible that Juliana is going to circle back and become the supplier for Ronnie's new organization. So let's keep an eye on that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that seems quite likely. What do you guys think about that? Let me know what you think about it right down there inside the comments. So Rock buys the Southside Shopping Plaza and that houses the beauty salon that we saw in the previous episode and also where they had the young Tommy reference in it as well and one of the buildings in which she was looking after. And the purpose again for her doing this is so that she can begin to clean all of her dirty money through legitimate businesses and so she can be fully legitimate and 100% sever all her ties to the game. Her getting set up in one of the spaces now where she is now approached by Officer Buckley and Officer Roland, who are dirty cops who also shadow as what is known as protection rackets. These are people that get business owners to pay them a fee for protecting them basically from themselves. I mean, they're the ones who, who do the vandalizing, who 
uh, do the break-ins and who do the harm, right? And it's uh, it's this whole cycle. And it's this known thing where it's very creative writing because it's actually very true. You see this a lot in, particularly in neighborhoods with higher minority-owned businesses where there are these protection rackets that pop up to go ahead and offer their services. We see this first happened in the Power Universe, actually in season six of the original Power, when Tasha opened up her kids' daycare and she was approached by some unscrupulous characters who also wanted to do a protection racket. So this is a known thing that happened within these neighborhoods, like I said, with higher minority-owned businesses. But these cops threaten her subtly enough where she gets the picture and know that they are going to be a problem. So I'm curious to see how this is going to play out because, you know, Rock is further distancing herself from the game. I mean, later on, we see back at home, she sees Unique wearing his strap again with her. And one of the two things happens here in her in her mind, right? And this is how I kind of see it. Either Rock decides to break things off with Unique in that moment because she has already set a plan in motion to get Kanan in trouble so that he can come home after she caught him moving product earlier in the episode. She plans a weapon in his bag and that in turn causes him to get caught with it at school when going through the metal detectors. And she knew that doing that would cause him to inevitably end up back at home under her watchful eye, just like what she wants. But this is going to cause a further divide between them because, again, it's another situation where as you went to Famous and you, Famous took money from you to stay silent and basically betray me. So that's going to cause more of a deeper rift between Kanan and Famous, but also Rock and Kanan as well. It's more of her trying to manipulate and move her way through his life. Hold on real quickly. You guys want to see something crazy? Over 99% of you guys that watch my content are not subscribed. So I'm asking real quickly, if you don't mind, just hit the like button and hit subscribe real quickly. I love to keep on giving this content to you guys and lets me know that people actually are interested. Feel free to do that, man. Really appreciate it a lot. Would help me out a long way in growing my small channel. Thanks. Now back to the video. But the second stream of thought I think she had in the moment when she was with Unique and she saw him having the strap was not just she wanted to get away from Unique and everything to do with the game. Because I think she generally has a, a, a liking for him. But I think it's also a reminder that she couldn't fully trust Unique or fully let her guard down with him. Just like she was able to do with Symphony. Symphony said to her, I want to be your home. Rock wants to build that home. She wants her son back at home. She wants to have legitimate businesses and she wants to have legitimate love. And I think she understands seeing him strapped was a reminder of a couple of things. Number one, he probably was strapped because of the fact that the last time or one of the times they were together, the Italians burst through the kitchen. So he wanted to be protected and to protect them. It's with this where they mutually decide to end their friends with benefits relationship and uh, decide to go their separate ways. And they were both kind of cool about it. And I don't know. I don't know if this is really truly over, guys. What do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of the persuasion that they might find them their way back to, you know, each other. If it's truly a friends with benefits thing, I mean, they'll find their way back maybe from time to time. Who knows, right? And then they say goodbye in the way that they say goodbye the only way they know how to. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Do you think Rock and Unique are really truly done? Are they going to introduce a new love interest for her or something like that? Or is this just a temporary break and they're still going to be messing around with each other? Let me know what you guys think about it inside the comments. Now, the overconfident Detective Howard is really playing with fire here. Agent Preston Tanner, who's from the FBI, who's now, he and his team are stationed in the Southside Jamaica, Queens precinct because of the investigation into the Italian mob hits that happened earlier in this season. He partners up with Detective Ogden, who we're introduced to in episode one, and he's from the NYPD Queens Narcotics Division. They have been sharing notes and have come together with a theory. So they pull in Detective Howard into a room just to get some questions from him, but they think that the whole Crown Camacho story with him being this kingpin with all these connections and enemies is just too convenient. So he tries to support it and throw them off rock sand and his scent also, right? But then they hit him with the, okay, cool, sure. Now what's going on with your shooting? Remember at the end of season one, after Detective Howard was shot by Kanan, he had to cover the whole thing up because he found that Kanan was his son. But this is a storyline element that was not forgotten. And now that it's come back up, that means that they're letting him know subtly, 
hey, you're a cop, we're cops, you're detectives, we're detectives as well. When we drop notes like that, just know we're onto something. And so he picks up on that clue. He goes back to Rock and tells her at her home later on that, that he cannot help her anymore, particularly after he had to help get Kane out of the trouble at school with the weapon earlier. He tells them that the FBI is onto him and also her. So he has to kind of cut ties for the moment, but we know he'll still be there for Kanan wherever he needs to. So again, Rock is out here with no protection from inside the camp, i.e. the law enforcement side of things, nor outside, whereas it's the game and maybe Unique would have been there for her. And not that she needed Unique to protect her, but she is disconnecting herself from that entire world. So she doesn't know who the players are and who's doing what anymore. And so now when these dirty cops come back to her door knocking again, how is she going to deal with that if she can't deal with it the way that she used to? So if you, I'm curious to see how that's going to play out with Rock, particularly uh, for the rest of the season. But we know that game's in you. you. You don't just walk away from the game like that. A very beautiful moment, oh my gosh, guys, was between Kanan and Jukebox. And that really just kind of had me like, wow. He wanted to take her to this fancy restaurant to celebrate her being selected into the singing group. And then we see them just bonding at cousins at dinner. And it's just such a heartwarming moment because they're more than just cousins. I mean, they grew up together. They're like brother and sister. So it's such a heartfelt moment. And it's even more difficult because it's now hard to imagine that when you see this scene and how they say, man, I love you. And uh, I'm so proud of you and, and just 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 a, such a genuine, intimate family moment that eventually he deletes her in the future for Tariq. And it is insane to think about the contrast between this scene and then that scene in the future. But it's even more difficult to see that this Kanan who, shout out to Makai Curtis, who is doing his best to shadow 50 Cent with his voice. I mean, he gets it really great sometimes, but some other times I just cringe like, eh. It's so difficult to think that future Kanan used to be this decent kid that we see now. And it's going to take some really, really clever acting and some really clever writing for them to convince us that this guy is going to be the monster that we see that takes out his, his basically his sister here, you know, in the future. And so now, guys, uh, I'm starting to see a thread possibly tie together. Here are the early parts of my theory and a possible prediction. I've been very careful with the whole Ronnie Breeze thing so far, just because it's really, really early, right? Ronnie needs a supplier and he also needs distributors. He has investors now, but he needs a supplier and he needs distributors. Kanan is now on ice and he's further away from the city because Rock's house is actually way further out, right? In a safer neighborhood. So he needs someone to run things for him where Famous can't because Famous is probably answering phones, but also because the more they're separated, I mean, they just can't get the operation done. But then also we have Unique. He needs distributors because Quan approached him earlier in this episode about business being slow. Unique telling him, listen, I got to just give me some time. So now we have all of these three different players who each need something that the other person has. So there is a potential two way or even three way partnership that's likely building. And this could potentially be the Kanan and Breeze relationship building. Now, let me put a disclaimer on there. I'm not saying either way, I think that Ronnie is Breeze and I'm not saying he's not Breeze. I, I'm saying there's a particular thing I'm waiting to see to confirm that. More specifically, the actor that plays Breeze, Grantham Coleman, he actually is a lead on a new show that just started a couple of weeks ago on Paramount+. Plus. So if he's going to become this bigger character within Raising Kanan, particularly now that they're shooting season four, I'm curious to see how you can be a lead character on that show and also be a lead character on this show and balance both of them. Not saying it's impossible. I'm just curious to see how that plays out. And that's my main reason for not fully jumping on board with the whole Ronnie is Breeze thing. It's the, the whole situation with the actor. He has, he's in the main cast for two shows at the same time and not in the recurring cast. But the running theory that a lot of fans have is that, and I've seen this in my comments a lot. So in my last video, there was a lot of conversation happening in the comments about the whole situation regarding Breeze and Ronnie and 
specifically D Wiz, because within that episode, we saw the first appearance of D Wiz since Lulu took him out in season one. And so that just further fed into the theory. A lot of fans have been speculating and what was also mentioned by B Jones in my last video was, hate to spoil it for everyone, but Breeze is D Wiz's brother. They gave us the clues already. Rock said that he was a wild boy in season one, known to have a lot of guns. They said in OG Power that Breeze was strong and they keep calling him D Wiz's brother like he doesn't have a name. When Ronnie was locked up, they called him by his name in season one. D Wiz's brother is still nameless. Problem solved, guys. Well, it's possible, very, very possible that that could be true. I think D Wiz appearing in the last episode and us not seeing him since season one was, uh, uh, could be the seed of something. I have problems with this theory just because in season one, when Rock was talking to D Wiz about how's his brother, he mentions how he just got out of lockup and his mom preferred him to probably be there just because he's, you know, he's a tough guy. That's a messed up thing to say about your child when you think about it. But if he was out of being locked up from upstate all this time, why hasn't he made a move on the streets as yet? And now with D Wiz having been deleted for since season one, there has been no retaliation on his brother's death. So we have to continue now to watch the two threads of this building theory between Ronnie Breeze or D Wiz's brother being Breeze. Let's have the conversation about it. Who do you guys definitively think based on all the clues so far, think is Breeze. Is it Ronnie or is it D was his brother? Let's talk about it in the comments. That's my breakdown for today, guys. This was such a fantastic episode. It feels like it just gives us so much more backstory into what's happening within the bigger universe that they're building within this show. And shout out to all of the amazing cast and crew who produced the show. Uh, I love breaking it down week after week. I'm not entirely sure if I'm gonna be doing a breakdown for the next episode because that's gonna be coming out when I am going to be on vacation and away from my recording setup. So we'll see how that's gonna play out, guys. But I will be back for the one after that if I don't do it next week. Let me know what you guys think about everything in the comments, all the theories discussed, all the, all the points. What do you think that I got right? What do you think that I got wrong? And what do you think that I missed? Let's hear about it, guys. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe. Until next time. Peace.